Hello, I'm Dr. Michael E. Face. On behalf of CME Outfitters, I'd like to welcome and thank you for joining us for today's educational activity entitled The Complete Response Addressing Antidepressant Selection for Patients with Major Depressive Disorder. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Takeda Pharmaceuticals USA Incorporated and Lundbeck. CME Outfitters is an award-winning, jointly accredited provider of continuing education for clinicians worldwide, so we're pleased to be partnering with them today. I also want to encourage everyone to join us today for our live Twitter conversation at CME Outfitters. We will be monitoring the Twitter feed and responding to your tweets as they come in. One last item I'd like to note is that we're using an enhanced platform today that allows you to save slides, take notes on slide, answer polling questions, and send us your questions. So please don't wait until the end to ask questions, and we'll be addressing your questions throughout the webcast. As I mentioned, I'm Michael Thace. I'm a professor of psychiatry in the Department of Psychiatry at the Perlman School of Medicine of the University of Pennsylvania, where I'm also a member of the medical and research staff of the Corporal Michael J. Crescent's VA Medical Center. We're both in Philadelphia. Um, I'd like to also welcome our my co-panelists today, Dr. Karen Hyden. Dr. Hyden is the Area Vice President for Palliative Care for Amadesis. Uh, Incorporated, located in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I, I'm sorry if I if I mispronounced your. Uh, no, nope. you did name. great. <laughs> also joining us is my longtime good buddy, Dr. Clay Jackson. Uh, this event marks the 20th anniversary of Dr. Jackson and I uh, first sharing uh, uh, the the dais. Uh, of course, we have a virtual dais today, but uh, uh, Dr. Jackson is a clinical assistant professor in family medicine and psychiatry at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Memphis, Tennessee. And, and Dr. Jackson shares the, um, <laughs> the distinction of being a, a, a long-suffering Cincinnati Reds fan along with me. Uh, Clay, welcome back. It's so great to be here with you, uh, with Dr. Hyden and with all of our learners tonight, our colleagues. It's wonderful to share this program. So let's jump right in with our first learning objective, which is to incorporate measurement-based care, or MBC, into primary care settings to identify suboptimal treatment responses in the therapy for patients with MDD. And this, of course, can impede our goals of remission and functional recovery. A uh, Karen, Depression is a serious debilitating disorder, and it's is often underestimated. What are your thoughts on this? I absolutely agree. I think it's um, underdiagnosed and undertreated, uh, partially because patients don't always realize that they're suffering with depression. But I think we can't ignore the data. And we know that even just with COVID from 2020 to 2021, um, the CDC reports that the adults with recent activity and depression rose from 36.4% to 41.5. And they reported unmet needs that went from 9.2% to 11.7%. So it is very serious and it's something that we, we need to be assessing for in primary care practice. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Clay, some wise person once uh, said that hindsight was 2020, but we've got a lot of foresight now when it comes to screening and early detection uh, of depression. Well, you know, hindsight may be 2020, but retrospective examination of the prevalence of depression is not as good as prospective examination. What we found is real time screening helps us to find about twice as much uh, depression. As you can see, from these comparison studies, there's a retrospective assessment that was done in the United States that showed around 15, 16% of patients actually had a lifetime prevalence of depression. But if you uh, look at the New Zealand study that's prospective, you actually find about twice that. Now, there's no way with that geography that New Zealanders are twice as depressed as Americans. Uh, this is because there's just better screening. And so later in the, in the talk, we'll get at how we can utilize um, integrated EHR tools and measurement-based tools to help us do a better job screening in busy primary care practices. Mm -hmm. 
Karen, as, a, as another primary care provider, what, you know, you're the gatekeepers, and, and you're the, but you're also the gatekeepers for a vast number of different medical conditions. Is it surprising to you that uh, we need to include psychiatric conditions in the mix? Not at all. Um, I think we all know that patients are more likely to see primary care providers um, just for everyday symptoms and uh, disease processes. But I think what might be surprising to people is that a lot of the symptomology that we see could be secondary to depression. Um, and so it is something that I think needs to be assessed more often again in primary care. But also, unfortunately, I think there's still a stigma around seeking mental health care. So I think patients are more likely to go to their primary care providers for symptoms of depression, even anxiety, than they would be to seek out mental health providers. Thanks, Karen. Let's let's come on back to Clay. Clay, um, do you do you feel like in your primary care practice you need to screen the very same way for depression that that you do for hypertension or or diabetes or or obesity? Yeah, and actually for the same reasons, uh, we need to screen because um, we can do something about it. It's an important illness that we can do something about, and it's common. You know, I I, I don't screen for for glioblastoma because it's rare enough in my practice, although it's important, it's rare enough that I'm not going to find a lot if I screen for it. Uh, you know, depression is, is um, it's common, as we saw from the, the prevalent slides, and we can do something about it, and it matters. You know, it's, it's, it's critical that we actually address repression to remission, and I, I know, Michael, that you've dedicated your career uh, to, to helping patients with depression find pharmacotherapy that can help drive remission, because if we don't, you know, if, if you have unremitted diabetes, people go on dialysis, people have heart attacks or strokes, people have amputations. If people have unremitted depression, then they have more episodes, they have presenteeism and absenteeism at work, uh, they have fractured relationships, and even their medical conditions can be quite um, debilitating and their cost for the medical conditions goes up if they don't have uh, remission from the depression. And so being able to follow therapy is critically important. And Clay, does heat us, do the heat us measurements give us any guidelines? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm actually delighted that the healthcare effectiveness and, and data and information set, the HEDIS set, actually includes screening uh, for depression. And I think they chose a great tool. It's the PHQ 9. I know in your guys' research world, there are multiple screeners that we can use and rating scales for depression symptomatology. I like the PHQ-9, I'm biased. It was developed by a primary care team, you know, Larry Kroenke uh, in the Midwest helped with the development there. And, um, you know, it's simple, it's patient rated and the head of scores tell us that we need to screen everybody age 12 and up and that we need to follow them over time to make sure that they get better. You know, if patients are not getting better, um, you know, what's the point of treating somebody with hypertension and saying, oh, your face is not red, I'll give you a year's refill. Um, or you know, with diabetes, oh, you're you're not getting up four times to urinate. Okay, it's fine. No, we get we get a sphygmomanometer out, we get a glucometer out, and we measure care. Same way with uh, with depression symptomatology. And the PHQ9 is a wonderful tool. It's an efficient tool for helping us gauge effectiveness. So that really serves as one of the anchors for your new practice of measurement-based care of depression. I've actually determined to never treat depression qualitatively again. Um, I intend to always include measurement-based care because it helps not only to drive better patient outcomes, it makes me a more conscientious practitioner and it makes me a more efficient practitioner. The big pushback from primary care has been, you can't put one more piece of paper in front of my patients. But I promise you, even if you're doing an analog style and it's not integrated in your EHR, the PHQ-2 screener and the PHQ-9 screener will make you a better clinician and a more efficient clinician. I think there's some good studies about this, right? And I think you have a slide coming up that uh, uh, may help make this point. You know, I have to be honest about this study. It actually shows that the lion's share of an improvement with algorithmic guided measurement-based care actually occurs in the moderately severe to severe patient type. Now, we might say in primary care, well, I don't see those patients, but the STARDI trial would actually uh, tell us that our patients are just as sick as those in many psychi psychiatric offices and actually may have more comorbidities. And so I think that uh, for mild to moderate patients, measurement-based care may not shine as greatly as it does in the more severe patients, 
but I don't think we should fool ourselves in primary care. There are lots of folks in our waiting rooms that actually have moderate to severe disease. And so I personally think MBC should be um, de rigueur for everyone. Uh, I think it makes me more efficient and I think it makes me better. And I think I'm like a lot of my colleagues around the country. You know, this is true for all of our effective interventions. The more severe the depression, the larger the effect size for that effective intervention, that the, the sicker the patient, the greater the room uh, for improvement. Now, there, there are some other tools that can be used in measurement-based care, and, and so I, I really want to make the point, it's, it's not just the PHQ, but the PHQ-9 is, is really a good example of a simple, practical quick to administer scale that, that really can come in handy in, in primary care. And we're gonna use the PHQ-9 to frame our discussion of our patient case for today, uh, the case of Barbara. And I'm sorry, my computer screen froze for just a moment. And, and so we are seeing that Barbara is scoring uh, 16 on the PHQ-9. And remember the highest score possible is 27 and a 16 is a score that is uh, higher than, than average. Uh, so uh, Karen, you wanna talk us through scoring uh, Barbara's PHQ-9? I do. Well, let's bring the audience in for a minute. So given that Barbara has a PHQ-9 score of 16, how would you all characterize her depression severity? You can choose A, mild, B, moderate, C, moderate to severe, and D, severe. Please vote now. Okay, so this is almost a split decision, but there is a plurality for um, moderate to severe. What do you think, Karen? Did our audience more often than not get that right? They did, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, given her scores, she would score moderate to severe. It is a close call though, because the cut point line is between 14 and 15. So, so she's just crossed into the moderate to severe or the moderately severe range. Now, let me get back to where I want to be. There we go. So, um, uh, Clay, uh, the PHQ-9 is really simple and, and easy to use and, and typically takes five minutes or, or less. Um, what, have you, I think you mentioned already that, that you've implemented it. Do you have anything, any other wisdom for us about its use? You know, what I found when I began is uh, using it some years ago is that, as I said, it made me more efficient. It also supplements what in family practice is sort of a pattern recognition, sort of right brain approach to patient diagnosis and assessment, you know, good, better, best, that sort of thing. It helped to quantify my management and to make my management better. I found that I consistently underestimated the burden of my patient symptomatology. And I also found that patients would tell truths to the paper that they would not mention to me. Um, and what I mean by that is sometimes they maybe thought I was busy or they had other concerns. And so I found that they would uh, put symptoms down and severity there that, that I might not notice. Uh, it forced me to be quantitative as well as qualitative in my assessment. And as you can see, because it goes over the sort of classic nine diagnostic criteria of depression, you get a qualitative sense of what's bothering the patient. Finally, item nine, which is a suicidality score, um, is, you know, it's, it's reassuring if they say zero and that they, they don't have that. But, you know, a score of one is several days in the last two weeks thinking that things would be better off if they weren't here or if they were, if they were dead. And so that's a, a degree of concern for suicidality, but also a marker for severity of disease that I find particularly troubling and that I want to ask patients about. And often they won't volunteer that information to me personally, but they will to the paper. Thanks. You know, um, if, if you just think of it in a simplistic way, you need five symptoms most every day to qualify for a diagnosis of depression. So not surprisingly, a score of 10 cuts you into the range of people who might be clinically depressed. And you also need to show about a 50% reduction 
in symptoms in order to say this person's getting better and not surprisingly moving from a 10 down to a five moves someone from just ill into uh, the well zone. So if you think about your, your rule of fives in interpreting uh, the PHQ-9, you, you will rarely see people who score 25, 26, 27, but a lot of your patients will be in the 15 uh, to 20 range. And as we talked about a bit ago, these are, these are the folks who may show the most improvement when you're using the PHQ-9 to monitor uh, their outcome. Uh, so Karen and, and Clay, um, depression is often accompanied by, by medical comorbidities, and, and you really often can't manage the person's medical condition without also addressing their depression and, and vice versa. Uh, would you like to share your thoughts on this topic? You know, we have here, this is, this is a study, sorry Karen, this is a study of uh, <laughs> medication changes, and we found that yeah. patients actually become more engaged in their therapy when their, their major depression is controlled. As you said, you know, Michael, uh, it's hard to get someone to worry about the glucometer uh, when they can't get out of bed. It's hard if they won't play with their kids uh, or they won't go to the soccer game. It's difficult to get them to, to care about their blood pressure or something that, you know, is, is, is way off in the distance in their mind. So I, I find these findings to be uh, non-surprising. And then, as we mentioned, the cost factor in, in the medical space is, is about 2x if you have a major depression disorder that's uncontrolled. And so by treating depression, we not only get better individual outcomes, we get better equitable outcomes in, in terms of health system. Karen, I, Karen, I you, so I'm turning back yeah, to you. No, Karen, in, in your oncology practice, do you see the same thing in people with cancer or, or people who are undergoing chemotherapy? Yeah, well, you know, what I was going to mention is the converse as well, where, you know, if symptoms are managed better, then you tend to see less depressive symptoms in a lot of cases. But, you know, we can take pain, for instance, and pain we often see in our oncology patients. And if their mental health is being addressed, um, they report lower pain scores. Um, and then obviously, if their pain is heightened and not being controlled well, they might report higher anxiety and depression scores. So we can't ignore the fact that the body is a whole system and works together, even though our healthcare system tends to be fragmented with a specialist for each organ. You know, we are a collection of systems that really work together. So we have to address it that way. Well, thanks. Clay, would you walk us through how you might begin to incorporate um, measurement-based care into your practice? Well, you know, the principles are you need to identify a target condition and as as we've already mentioned here, um, depression is an ideal target condition because it's common. It has important sequelae if it's not treated, and there are effective treatments, as we're going to discuss later in our talk. And so you want to identify best measures. Obviously, I'm a PHQ-9 fan and in primary care because it's part of the HEDIS measures. Uh, we do get quality pay for that, and so form has followed function. Uh, we used to complain that quality wasn't paid for. We can't make that complaint anymore. It's just not true. We're being paid to do good care. Um, and then you need to create the methods for that. And my method is simply that my MA or my assistant who's helping to room the patient gives the patient the PHQ-9 when they come back for follow-up exams or for the initial visit if we know it's about mental health. Um, everyone gets screened as a new patient with PHQ-2. And if they're positive on PHQ-2, we automatically drop into PHQ-9. I'll also tell you that um, I, as part of my career, I also administrate a palliative practice um, in a busy oncology center, and every one of those new consults gets a PHQ-9. So I would challenge anyone to say that the practice is too busy or that patients are too sick to complete the PHQ-9 because we do it with stage four cancer patients, and they they actually like the test because or, or the screener because it opens up levels of discussion with uh, with us uh, in terms of how to, to treat them well. So Karen, why don't we move on to our second learning objective and talk talk about kind of making a treatment plan and, and the, just overviewing the principles of how we care for people with major depressive disorder. Uh, would you like to lead off? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, we have to assess and um, identify that there is a problem, but ultimately the goal of treatment in major depressive order is to help these patients really get quality of life back. So we want them to remit. We want them to regain their functionality to Clay's point earlier. We really want them to enjoy doing things that are important to them. So spending time with family, um, just enjoying their life. And so we have to use measurement-based care to measure whether or not we're reaching those goals and specifically from the perception of the patients. 
Um, we do have to include patient preference and we'll talk about their decision-making here in a few slides. It's important for us to know what they're comfortable with. And of course, we wanna start with the safer, less expensive options and then move up from there if, treat if the treatment is not, or the patient's not responding to the treatment. So, so Clay, I know you brought us Barbara's case uh, for tonight's presentation. So let's check back in on her. You you recognize she was depressed and you got her started on treatment. How is she now doing? So we started her on an SSRI. That's where a lot of primary care clinicians are going to start. And frankly, a lot of psychiatrists. Um, at three weeks, titrated to 100 milligrams. And this may surprise some people in terms of the rapidity of the titration. But as we're going to examine a little later, there's some data that show if you do use NBC or measurement-based care, you might be able to make some treatment decisions a little faster than we have traditionally done it with the qualitative management. She had some mild nausea. We expect that with some of the SSRIs. She had some delayed sexual response that she complained of. But otherwise, she said she tolerated the medication okay and said that she could continue to take it. Her PHQ-9 has moved downward uh, in the right direction but in a fairly unimpressive way. It's gone from 16 uh, to 14. Uh, at visit three, that's on week five, we brought her back for a quick follow-up. And um, she says, maybe I'm a little better, but I'm just not myself. Again, we're down from a, a beginning point of 16. We went to 14 and now to 11. So we're trickling down. Uh, but you know, I just ask you, what, what do you think about this response? Is it impressive or uh, are still uh, you got some concerns? So again, I, I advised our group to look at for a 50% reduction to say this is the real thing. And, and here we got, I, I think, a 12.5% re reduction. So, so this is a tiny bit better, but, but certainly she's still moderately depressed. So why don't we bring our audience back in and, and ask your advice? What, what is the ideal next step for Barbara? Is it A, increase the dosage of sertraline? B, augment sertraline with a tricyclic antidepressant, such as amitriptyline. C, switch her to a selective serotonin reuptake, uh, selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, uh, like levomonasoprine. Please note there's a typo in the question. Just noticed after all these iterations, switch her to a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, an SNRI, like levomonasoprine. D, uh, switch her to an agent with mixed serotonergic receptor effects such as velazidone or vortioxetine or E, refer out to a psychiatrist. So let's go ahead and, and, and get your recommendations here. Okay, shoot. I am not seeing. Can one of you help me out here? The, the, the majority of our respondents said they wanted to increase the dosage of the sertraline. Um, and I respect it philosophically, but the data are not that great. Are they on sertraline, Michael? Uh, tell me with, with going up from 100 um, to 200. Sertraline's full therapeutic range is from 50 to 200. So it, there is value and it is a conservative thing. If, if, uh, if if you have no dose limiting side effects, but but as as you say, Clay, the evidence is uh, not so uh, dramatic when you look at the the value of of going higher as opposed to doing something different. I, I mean, very very often expert uh, uh, expert guidance would would say to go ahead and and switch to do something else. I'm really surprised that only one percent of our colleagues said refer to a psychiatrist. I I really respect these guys that are online right now. Uh, they're willing to take on this tough patient. And so that's that's pretty cool to me. This is a, a, a tough-minded bunch willing to square their shoulders and, and, and get the job done. So um, we're, we're going on now to our choices among our um, other possible antidepressants. And so, you know, there was a time sertraline was the number one antidepressant prescribed in the United States, and it's still one of the top five prescribed. And I think this is even more so true in primary care than in psychiatry. Uh, Clay, for somebody who didn't respond to sertraline, what are the other options you might think about? Well, you know, we typically go down the rabbit hole of, of pharmacotherapy, um, but, you know, also there are other non-farm therapies. I, 
I wondered if uh, if Karen could give us a talk about what are some of the non-farm treatments, uh, some of the lifestyle things that can be done and exercise. Sure. And first, I just wanted to state, you know, these are the three most most common management strategies, but I think. Um, doing any one of them alone is not as powerful as combining into a more holistic approach of maybe trying all three. Um, pharmacotherapy is great for, you know, symptom management physically and um, psychotherapy is wonderful to help with stress reduction. But then, yes, there are non-farm approaches. that are very powerful um, lifestyle changes. So exercise is incredibly helpful as a stress reduction um, a lot of times people will get out and once they start exercising, they can turn that into a practice. They might meet other people and socialize. It can be a distraction from maybe stressors. Um, and also, of course, it produces the good endorphins. We do know that research shows that an anti-inflammatory diet, like a Mediterranean diet um, with high fruits and vegetables and good fats and low processed foods, low sugar, um, is associated with increased depression symptoms as well. Um, of course, good sleep hygiene, making sure that they're getting enough rest. Um, and then vitamins and micronutrients. So things that you all can also monitor in your practice is vitamin D levels, magnesium, and the B vitamins. Those are very powerful as well when it comes to the symptoms of depression. Well, I think also psychotherapy, you know, we didn't mention it for Barbara, but if she's willing now, patient concordance with desired therapy is very important. If she wants to take pills and you try to make her talk, it doesn't work well. If you, um, if she wants to talk and you try to make her take pills, it doesn't work well either. So concordance with therapy is, is important, but if she's willing to do talk therapy, it, it works it well and also plays well with pharmacotherapy, if, if you don't mind that, that, that pun or play on words. We, um, you know, CBT, or MBCT can be can be a very effective. With respect to pharmacology, I think probably Michael, the, the 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 revolution that we've seen over the last two decades has been augmentation. We, we talk a lot about switching antidepressants, and we'll talk about what to do with Barbara. But um, lithium T3 or lithiourine, these are these are older older styles of augmentation. The atypical antipsychotics have been um, a, a mainstay for the last 15 to 18 years. And, and many of them have indications for, for add-on therapy or augmentation therapy. Brand new stuff is, is um, esketamine um, and, and the psychedelic drug, and uh, that has been effective as well. So there's lots of things that, that we can do. I think your next slide shows our, our most commonly used antidepressants. Again, SSRIs, the lion's share of starts and switches. SNRIs or, or noradrenergic agents, uh, you get two neurotransmitters uh, for the price of one drug there. They're a little bit tougher to take in terms of adverse events, and they're a little bit more effective. We'll see a study on that later. TCAs are old drugs. Many of them have noradrenergic and serotonergic activity. Uh, when we invented them, we, we really didn't know their mechanism of, of action very well, so we just call them tricyclics. It's a, it's a structural category, not a functional category. But the problem with TCAs is that they have a lot of nuisance side effects. They're very powerful drugs. They work but they're a little difficult to take. And then obviously in overdose, they're incredibly dangerous because um, mm -hmm. you and I are old enough, Michael, that we've tried to treat neurogenic shock and it's very difficult to treat that. And that's obviously the, the, the adverse event of overdose of TCAs. Um, um, the monoamine uh, uh, oxidase inhibitors are great drugs uh, if you're a pharmacologist. They're, they're very, very difficult uh, to manage with diet because they have, uh, they have, they're associated with weight gain, but also uh, you have uh, tyramine responses that, that make taking these drugs pretty difficult in terms of adverse events, unless you're very rigidly following a, a diet. A wine and cheese party is, is not a good place to go in MAOI. Yeah. You, you know, I, not ironically, when the tricyclics were the leading antidepressants in the United States, they were the leading cause of death by self-poisoning. Uh, because because even a week's worth of a full dose of a tricyclic antidepressant can uh, uh, poison a, a sensitive person. So, uh, uh, Clay, what uh, aside from lethality and overdose with the older tricyclics, if you think about some of your favorite first and second line antidepressants, what would you say their major limitations are? Well, for me, those are going to be in, in most cases SSRI, SNRI, or uh, uh, the noradrenergic dopaminergic drug, the propion. You know, if you look at who you intend to treat and if they respond, you're only about half to two thirds of patients respond. And then if you're looking at remission, it's about a third. So, you know, that's disappointing. Um, 
there, there is an advantage over placebo if you look at them, but it's not really robust in terms of effect size. And then, you know, if you're looking at a 15% advantage over placebo, if you're splitting the difference, adverse events in, in, in up to 10%, a lot of patients don't tolerate these drugs well and they stop them. And then there's some other key associated symptoms such as cognition and anxiety that can be problematic, uh, insomnia, that these drugs may have varying effects on. And then, you know, you got to prepare a patient to say, hey, it may take up to two to three months for this drug to take its, its maximum effect. That's kind of tough to take for somebody who says, uh, I can't go to, again, my kid's soccer match. So, so these are some disappointing aspects of treating depression that honestly we all face and patients face. We have to be realistic about them, but there are some newer agents that may address some of these concerns. Well, so um, one approach is to take a proven mechanism like serotonin reuptake inhibition and then to try to tailor or, or modify the SRI effect by, by muffling or enhancing certain relevant postsynaptic serotonin receptors. And, and two of our more recently introduced antidepressants, uh, vortioxetine and, and velazodone, are, are examples of, of this. Uh, vortioxetine begins with serotonin reuptake inhibition, uh, but, but as you build the dose, you recruit multiple other effects on, on serotonin receptors, perhaps as many as five different recept different receptor effects, in, including uh, being, being a fairly potent uh, antagonist of serotonin 7 receptors, the only one of our antidepressants that, that can claim that. Um, I, I have a, a, a slide up to share that, that shows the kind of the risk benefit uh, equation for vortioxetine and it's it's quite favorable so so one of the aspects of this modification at the postsynaptic receptor level is that that you may get either a, a slightly stronger effect or a, an effect with with some fewer side effects now with respect to the possibility of a stronger effect i, I want to point out that that vortioxetine has, has a very nice dose response relationship, meaning that, that you get increased effectiveness as you move from the starting dose, which is often five milligrams a day, to the middling dose, which is 10, up to the higher dose, which is uh, uh, 20 milligrams a day. And, and of course, the ascending dose response relationship probably also reflects recruiting more of those uh, secondary uh, effects on serotonin neurotransmission. Uh, uh, the lazodone has the primary effect, which is serotonin reuptake inhibition, and then a secondary effect, which is a fairly potent and partial agonism uh, of serotonin 1A receptors. And, and so this is kind of like the combination of an SSRI and a high dose of buspirone, except it's integrated into one medication. And the lazodone is indeed an, an effective antidepressant, um, but the, the effect on that serotonin 1A system is so um, powerful that, that you can't start at a full therapeutic dose. So you have to do some up titration from 10 to 20 uh, to 40. And so the, the potential of, of a faster unfortunately, is, is partly defeated by having to do the, the, the conventional uh, upward titration. So uh, a good rule of thumb is to have one or two of the older generically available SSRIs, one or two uh, of the SNRIs kind of in your toolkit, and then to have some familiarity uh, with, with these newer, uh, more um, kind of modified uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, for your patients. Uh, Clay, in, in your practice, do you have success when you switch away from one class of antidepressant to another? You know, I think theoretically it makes sense to switch from uh, one class to another, uh, to go from maybe simplistic pharmacology to more sophisticated pharmacology. But there are good data to support that, uh, let's just say SSRIs, if you switch within class, uh, there are good data to support that a second drug within a class may be effective. I, I think um, what we've seen in meta-analyses that is there's a slight favorability to switching outside of class. What we're seeing here in terms of numbers from primary care is that, you know, most of us start, the majority start with an SSRI, but even if we switch, we tend to go to another SSRI. And if you want to do that, I think there's data to show 
that that is, is not a foolish strategy. It, it can be effective. I personally prefer to switch outside of class, um, unless I have a compelling reason. Maybe somebody tells me a first degree, a relative responded to a, a, another drug and we didn't know that, or um, a patient really invested in trying another SSRI. Um, they're really worried about adverse events or something. Um, I typically switch across class. And the, the next series of slides first show us a meta-analysis of switching from SSRI to SNRI versus to another SSRI. And you see a modest advantage favoring the switching across class. And then with from an SSRI to either vortioxetine, a multi-action medication, or escitalopram, again, a, a modest advantage for uh, the, the more uh, complex antidepressant. And, and then looking at other reasons for switching. So for example, switching because of sexual side effects. And, and here you see evidence from studies of uh, vortioxetine and, and velazidone, where, where you see the benefit of switching resulting in a lower incidence uh, of sexual side effects. So uh, I, I think importantly, we, we, have a, a, we have more tools in our toolkit now than, than ever before. And I do agree, Clay, that, that the the rationale of going from simpler to more um, complex. Complex here meaning multi-action antidepressants really makes good sense for our patients with more difficult to treat and depression. So why don't we move on to our third objective now and, and Karen and Clay, now that we've talked about our favorite antidepressants and then the role of, of switching uh, between antidepressant classes, uh, let's move on and, and talk about our best practices for how to do a switch and uh, what to take into account, residual symptoms and adequate response or intolerable side effects. So Karen, what are your most important considerations when you're making this kind of treatment decision for one of your patients? Well, I think Clay already touched on a few of them, but definitely, you know, has the patient ever been treated before and what, were, what was the response to that type of treatment? Has there been a family member that um, has been treated or is being treated and has a positive response? And can we try that first? Um, you know, what are the, the side effects to consider? And then how would that affect the patient's quality of life? So what is the patient's preference for treatment as well once we educate the patient about the treatment, how long the treatment um, will take to have an effect typically, and then the potential side effects. Um, and then of course, any interactions with any existing conditions um, outside of the depression as well that would need to be considered in treatment. Great, thank you. I, I just peeked over at the questions. We got 31 uh, different questions that have come in. So we wanna make sure we allow uh, plenty wow. of time for that. So um, one of the questions that just came in was, was please go over the differences in mechanisms of action again. So with the two of your, um, uh, with the two of your permission, I'm going to take one minute and take a step back. Please and, do. And, yep. and, and so our most widely prescribed antidepressants are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They do one thing and one thing strongly within their therapeutic range, and, and that is uh, block the serotonin transporter. The SNRIs do two things, and, and that is they begin normally by blocking the serotonin transporter, and as you increase the dose, they, they begin to block the norepinephrine transporter too. So these are dual acting antidepressants. Uh, the two newer medicines we talked about uh, briefly, uh, vortioxetine is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It blocks the transporter. And then it has five different effects on serotonin re receptors. And I can't rattle off all five uh, uh, off of my hands, but, but one of them is the unique serotonin effect, the serotonin seven effect. There are also serotonin one, A, B, C, and D effects, as well as serotonin uh, three receptor actions. Uh, vortioxetine is truly a serotonin modulator. 
in addition to being an, SSR, an SRI. And, and then finally, velazodone is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor very potently and, and has a, a very potent effect also on the serotonin 1A receptor. That is primarily a presynaptic receptor, which enhances the, the neuronal response to serotonin reuptake uh, inhibition. So, so I hope that clarifies things a little bit. We've not talked much more about levomonasoprin. It is one of those SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, and it is the third of our three most recently introduced uh, antidepressants. So why don't we come on back to where we took that little break and uh, uh, Clay, we have a kind of a spaghetti plot here, but we want to make a, a point about uh, uh, patients' outcomes being diverse. Could you walk us through this one, please? I, I affectionately call this the spaghetti slide. And, uh, you know, every drug talk we've ever been to has two curves, and they separate out in a few weeks, and then you start to get stars and asterisks that show that there's statistical significance. And that's why the drug company is promoting it, because it's proven to work. It works in populations, but the spaghetti slide reminds us that re individuals respond as individuals, not as averages. No patient is a linear regression line. And so we have to remember that when you give somebody an antidepressant, this is why you have a boxed warning to tell patients, if you worsen, if you feel suicidality, if you, if you don't feel better, please give me a call. And some patients are gonna get better very quickly, Others are gonna get worse. Most are gonna be in the middle. Um, and, and so there is that average line. These drugs do work, but the spaghetti slide reminds us that we're treating individuals. And when you give a patient an antidepressant, you've given one patient an antidepressant. You can't rely on studies from a thousand people to show what the patient in front of you is gonna do. Well, if you were just looking at the patient in front of you right now, what factors about his or her history or current presentation might worry you about their lower chances for success? You know, if I had the wrong diagnosis, it's hard to get the right result. Uh, if I've missed bipolarity, and we know that uh, of patients with depression or anxiety or patients who are treated with an SSRI in primary care, uh, some studies show that 25, 28% of those patients can screen positive for bipolarity. Um, how severe and how long has this depression been there? There's sort of an idea of area under the curve. If somebody's been depressed for five years, that's somebody that I'm gonna think about getting to somebody like you sooner rather than later. Uh, psychotic depression is very difficult for me to treat in primary care. I'm, I'm, I'm really gonna think about referral for someone who has psychosis uh, because they require a level of care that most primary care offices uh, just can't provide. I certainly can't do that. Patients with anxiety, that's going to mitigate against remission. Depression plus anxiety is, is tough to treat. I, I, I often uh, bring in a GAD-7, a Generalized Anxiety Disorder 7 scale, which is very similar to CHQ-9, to help me assess anxious uh, symptoms. Of the personality disorder, so-called what we used to call access to can make treatment difficult because it can affect the therapeutic relationship if you're not aware of that. Uh, early age of onset, again, area under the curve and early age of onset might indicate bipolarity. Comorbid substance abuse is obviously uh, difficult. You know, pills work better when people take them. So if people are not taking uh, the medicine, it, it's hard for it to, to, to work. We'll talk about it here in a little bit. So those are some factors I, I'm concerned about. Well, so Clay, um in your spaghetti plot, there are some strands of spaghetti that are neither in the well group nor in the ill group. Kieran, talk with us about the incompletely remitted patient or the, the partial responder. Well, I think it definitely points back to the spaghetti slide and to Clay's point that, you know, we're not treating, um, well, we're treating an individual, basically, and each individual is going to perceive symptoms even differently. So, you know, we could have um, a full remitter, we might have a partial remitter, and we might have a non-remitter. And for the partial remitters, you know, they might get quality of life back. You know, they might be able to enjoy and do things that they weren't able to do before treatment, even though maybe they're still experiencing some sexual dysfunction or insomnia or weight gain. Maybe there are things that they're willing 
um, to deal with it for the simple fact that they have their quality of life back. So, um, you know, that treatment goal for that patient may be met at that point, even though they're not a full remitter. So it's certainly better than not responding, but, but I think it's also fairly true that you don't really return to your pre-morbid state of productivity or quality of life and romantic relationships or, or, or capabilities as a parent and, and, unless you get a, a fuller response. And this is another way I think that measurement-based care helps us in everyday practice because sometimes I'm better um, means that you're back to your well self and sometimes it means that you've got a fair amount of symptom suppression but you're still not quite well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Clay, when do you when do you begin to evaluate whether the treatment's working with one of your patients? You know, I look at two weeks, Michael. Um, if I don't have the patient follow up in two weeks, I'll have them take a PHQ-9 home for homework and let them call into the office and tell me what their score is and just how they're doing. Nurse can take that call, give me the information. It's a way to sort of expand my capacity without uh, clogging up the, the, the follow-up appointments. Um, but, you know, the reason why I look at two weeks is is based on the strength of this study. Now, uh, this one is a this is a a HamD um, rating scale. It's not a PHQ nine, so that's an important caveat here. But I, I was very impressed when I saw these findings. This is about a decade old, a little more. And what it does show us is that if you if you don't have a twenty percent response basically at the two week mark, uh, you, you've only got about a, a one in nine shot of having a response at, uh, at, the, at the six or eight week mark. And so, um, you know, waiting and waiting and waiting months to see if you're gonna get a response for a given drug and a given dose doesn't make sense on the basis of this study. Um, it, it's still not a guarantee. If they respond by 20% at two weeks, still only about half of them respond at two months fully. Um, but but if, if they're not responding at two weeks, you need a different drug or a different dose, or you need to ask them about adherence. Something else is going on, uh, and you're unlikely to for things to get better if you keep doing the same thing. We all know the definition of insanity, uh, and if you're not getting a 20% response in two weeks, it's insane to keep doing it over and over. Yeah, so so this is a little um, this is a little pearl to take home. You you can't reliably predict response in two weeks, but you can reliably predict non-response, and, yes. and so not showing even a modicum of improvement. Uh, less than 20% is not much. Uh, not showing even that tiny amount of improvement is a very powerful predictor uh, of subsequent treatment failure. And, and so you, you don't need to wait six or eight more weeks to see that that treatment's gonna fail. You, you've got 90 plus percent certainty it's gonna fail just based on how little the person's approved early on. And, and this just goes to show us that, that I mean, that, improvement is a kind of a naturally improving uh, situation and, and people go from a little better to a lot better to even more better and so forth over those six to eight weeks. So, so not moving in, in the right direction is a really good early predictor of needing to do something different. And so on that note, Clay, bring us back in. How's Barbara doing now? Yeah, you changed her antidepressant. Is she doing any better? Well, let's hope so. It says here that she got her bounce back. So that sounds kind of exciting. Uh, we talked about adherence with her. Uh, she said it was very good, but not, not perfect. Here, here's a pearl. Uh, don't make adherence qualitative. Are you taking your medicine? Are you adhering? The patient's usually going to nod their head and say yes. Make it quantitative. Hey, a lot of patients miss doses of their medication. Have you missed any doses since we saw you last? About how many doses have you missed or what percentage of the time? You'll get much better answers if you ask the question in, in that way. Um, because she was at 100 milligrams, I chose not to go up to 150 or 200 uh, because she already had two side effects. She already had some, some nausea and some sexual dysfunction. Um, given that the data weren't that great with going up on the dose in terms of efficacy and that she already had exhibited two adverse events, I actually switched. I went from simple pharmacology, SSRI, into the vortioxetine. I, I got those uh, the SSRI plus the five serotonin receptor modulation effects with her voyoxetine. Um, I asked her if she wanted to do uh, MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, a very good therapy, lots of proven activity across multiple studies. She said no, uh, but we did make a goal of walking 150 minutes a week. Uh, she agreed to download an app on her phone to do some self-guided meditation. 
Um, and to Karen's point, she agreed to an anti-inflammatory diet. She, she really wanted to lose some weight. She thought that would make her feel a little bit better overall, both mentally and physically. And so I, I agree with an anti-inflammatory diet for her. And then we brought her back for the fourth visit. This was two weeks after starting Vortiox. I typically try to bring patients back two weeks after a dose change or a drug change. HQ9 was, was down to eight. Again, this is mild symptomatology, but uh, she's lost that item nine score, that suicidality. That's, that's no more suicidality. And then uh, pointedly, her GAD7, her anxiety score, is down to four. So I was pretty pleased with this uh, because it represented a 20% response. Uh, in a two-week time period after school agent. So I, I, I thought this was a good response. Yeah, and if we get back to kind of those simple rules of thumb for scoring, we, we've got uh, a 50% reduction from where we began and a score that is just a shade above kind of the threshold for being not ill. So, so she has gone from ill to better and is, is only a few symptom points away from uh, moving from better to, uh, to remission. And, and hopefully these homework assignments and the self-help help activities that, that you've recommended will, will make a nice difference. So, so that brings me to uh, uh, talking a bit about the STAR-D study. Now, this, this is getting long in the tooth because we, we had our first papers on the study in, in, in 2006, so that's 15 years ago now. Uh, but but STAR-D was conducted in both psychiatric settings and primary care settings, and, and it was a, a multi-stage study that compared various reasonable choices, reasonable options for patients circa 2001, 2002, uh, after they did not respond to a first trial of a perfectly good SSRI. In the STAR-D case, it was uh, citalopram. And as, as you can see in, in this uh, uh, schematic, that, that as we went from first line to second line to third line to fourth line uh, treatments, uh, a, a slowly, progressively larger proportion of patients went from ill to well, um, although the probability that the next treatment would work diminished with, with each level of care. So as, as depression becomes more heavily treated, um, it, it, it really does, when you go from a third line to a fourth line treatment, the chances that that treatment will shine uh, actually start to go down. So the, this gets us to the aphorism that the easy to treat or easy to treat and the, the harder to treat become progressively harder to treat as you, as you move through uh, your treatment uh, options. But if we go back to the beginning of the STAR-D for, for our patients who did not respond to a really good trial uh, of citalopram, one of the fundamental decisions was to switch or to augment or use an adjunctive treatment strategy. Uh, so uh, Karen and, and Clay, come on back in and help me out here. Uh, what factors influence your decisions to recommend switching or augmenting uh, when the initial choice of therapy fails? Well, one of mine, uh, one of mine Michael, is, is STAR-D and, and the findings. And so I know that you were an investigator in Star D, and although it's 15 years old, I love Star D. So please don't, please don't call it old. I, I love it. I, I would say though that one thing that's happened in the ensuing 15 years is that we've learned to use atypical antipsychotics, which were not included in Star D as an augmentation strategy. We've also used to, uh, we've learned to use one carbon agent such as L-methylfolate um, and uh, S-adenosyl methionine. So there are other augmentation agents that we have. That we didn't have uh, in Star D, and so so the augmentation arm might look a little different if we used uh, some of those agents uh, today. Karen, feel free to chime in. I mean, basically, um, I consider switching when something good is not happening and something bad is happening. If I'm already having <laughs> adverse events like we did with Barbara, uh, and I'm not getting where I want to go in terms of response or remission, it's time to flip the switch. Why keep a bad drug around? Uh, if it's bad for that patient, let's get to a, a better option. But uh, on the on the converse, if if I am getting uh, if I am getting some response and the patient is doing better and they're not having adverse events, I, I might add to it. You know, don't go back to base camp if you're if you're already halfway up Everest. Don't climb back down. Uh, keep what you've got and add to it in terms of an, an adjunctive medication. Some patients don't want to take two drugs for one problem, and so patient preference makes a, a difference as well. 
Yeah, I absolutely agree, Clay. And if if we could stick to the first treatment because they're having a positive response, then there's you know less chance of them having withdrawal effects as well. Um, and you know if there is a specific residual symptom that needs to be addressed, then an adjuvant um, is a good idea too. So just lots of factors to consider, but definitely patient preference should be included in there as well because we want them to be compliant and take the medication. To your point, it won't work if they're not taking it. So. Yep. So the part of the part of Star D that I personally oversaw and, and helped to supervise was the the arm that involved Beck's model of cognitive therapy, and, and I, I feel we'd be remiss not to point out that the the patients who got cognitive therapy instead of an alternate medication or or a adjunctive treatment strategy uh, had every bit as good a chance of responding or, or remitting uh, after 12 weeks of treatment. They that got there very well. They got there a little bit slower than the pharmacotherapy people did, but they got there with fewer side effects. And so uh, the, 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 for people who would rather approach their depression from a, a psychotherapeutic model, at the first and second line treatment interventions, we have good alternate choices uh, available. Uh, for and Michael, I, Michael, if I could just interrupt it, you know, yeah. on the backside, we talked about slow, uh, slow responses in, in psychotherapy, but on the, on the converse end of it, when we stop therapy, cognitive effects last a lot longer than pharmacologic effects, right? Isn't it, isn't it good to, if you can get the patient to do, to do CBT or MBCT, doesn't it last longer after the, you know, patients say, can I get off therapy? Uh, once they've done talk therapy, doesn't the effect last longer in terms of keeping them uh, disease free? If, if you've responded to an antidepressant medication, but then stop it within the first few months of benefiting, your chances of relapsing are significantly higher than if you responded to a psychotherapy. So the, the pharmacotherapy does require uh, a continuation phase. Psychotherapy typically doesn't require a continuation phase when it, when it works to good benefit. So, um, Clay, think about kind of pros and cons. Should I switch or should I use an adjunct? What, what in your mind's eye would be the best reasons to switch? Best reasons to switch is you, you're not where you want to go and something bad has happened. Uh, adverse events or the patient's not tolerating the drug. Um, adjunctive, uh, something good has happened, but you're not quite there. Or you can take advantage of, of perhaps particular qualities of certain agents. You know, Sometimes in using the atypical antipsychotics, some of them tend to be sedating. If I pay, have a patient with a lot of insomnia, maybe, maybe that comes into play because we might treat insomnia with the adverse event or so-called adverse event or side effect of, of one of the, uh, of the augmentation agents. So it, it just depends on that patient and how they're doing. Um, but typically you like to keep things clean if you can. But I find that complex patients often require complex pharmacotherapeutic regimens. And so we talked about the advantages of some of the drugs that have multiple effects. You know, I just don't think that an SSRI alone for most patients is going to get you where you want to go with remission. And the data show that. Uh, so if, if, if that's your one drug you're sticking to, there's going to be a lot of augmentation. Sometimes you switch to more complex pharmacology, you may actually get multiple targets with one drug. Okay, well, I'm gonna to try to retrieve my ability to uh, see the answers as these come in, but we've moved on to our, uh, our next audience response question. And, and so we're back to Barbara, and I'll just remind you that uh, Dr. Jackson had started Barbara out on sertraline, but when she failed to show a meaningful benefit, uh, when that treatment failed to deliver, remember it's the medicine that fails, not the patient. When that medicine failed to deliver a, a meaningful benefit, uh, uh, Dr. Jackson switched her from sertraline to vortioxetine. So let's bring our audience in. Um, what would be your next approach? Um, what would be your preferred approach to switch from sertraline to vortioxetine or any other? Uh, different antidepressant for that matter. Would you immediately stop sertraline and start vortioxetine? That's A. B, would you gradually taper the sertraline, get it done, and then start, start the vortioxetine? That's B. Uh, or would you gradually withdraw sertraline while waiting to begin 
of ortioxetine, or would you taper the sertraline while concurrently slowly increasing the dose of ortioxetine? That, that would be D. So you got four different approaches to making this uh, uh, transition go. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and, and take uh, what the next 15, 20 seconds to vote, and, and I will try to retrieve my ability to see answers. Nope, haven't gotten there yet. So uh, uh, Clay or someone who can see the answers, help me out here, please. Uh, by an overwhelming majority, people voted for four. They're gonna cross taper. Uh, yeah. they're, gonna, they're gonna reduce the sertraline slowly over two weeks. Uh, they're gonna increase the vortioxetine simultaneously. A, uh, a distant second was immediately stop sertraline and start vortioxetine the next day. But most people wanted number four, Michael. Well, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why this is wisdom, uh, because uh, remember, at, at the basis, vortioxetine is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So you don't have to worry much about a discontinuation syndrome because you're, you're covering the withdrawal of a serotonin reuptake inhibitor with, with another serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So, so that is, I, I, I agree, uh, that's the way I would do it. Uh, when I'm in a pinch or like in a hospital, you know, inpatient unit, I, I might just start one and stop the other one. Uh, but uh, uh, when you've got the luxury of doing this uh, transition, I, I think that you can uh, um, go slower. So, all right, I'm back in the moderator benefit. Okay, let's see. So we are still having a problem here. Okay, well, I think that might be the last one of these anyway. So I will uh, come back to read your questions here in, in, in a moment. Uh, Karen, um, overall, when we're thinking about uh, optimal management, um, we always wanna try to engage and make our, our patient as much of a participant in the treatment process as possible. What, what words of wisdom for us do you have about encouraging that? Sure. Well, we use um, shared decision-making decision every day in palliative care. Um, and what I love about this is that, you know, as medical professionals, practitioners, we come with evidence-based knowledge that we can share with patients and deliver it to them in, in, in a way that they can understand it. And so by educating them, we're empowering them and ultimately allowing them to make decisions that they're comfortable with. Um, and I think to to a lot of points that were made earlier, you know, to have um, compliance with the medication regimen, the patients really need to understand why they need to take the medications when they take them, why they need to be consistent in the taking of the medication, and why it's really important to let the doctors know when they stop the medication. And then if they're comfortable with the treatment regimen that you all have come to together, then they're more likely to stay on that treatment long term as well. Um, to your point earlier, you know, with the pharmacology, it's really important for the patients to remain on the treatment long term to really get the benefit. Um, so overall, it's about empowering the patient and allowing them to feel comfortable with their treatment choices. Well, great. Great. Could you go ahead and, and go on to the, the next slide as well, please? Absolutely. So for medication adherence, you know, again, it's important for them to understand why they're taking the medications that they're taking, to understand even what to expect with um, any side effects or adverse events. So they know what to look for and they know when to call you. Um, and in addition to make sure that they understand how important it is to let their providers know if, if they're having any issues, but also if they're planning to stop their medication. Um, it's important as well for, you know, in order to, to keep in touch with your patients and make sure that the treatment is working and that they're not having any negative effects, that follow-up that Clay was talking about. So even if they don't come in within two weeks of starting treatments, at least touching base with them or having a nurse reach out to them and, um, you know, to get the results of their, um, of their assessment just so they can let you know kind of where they are and if that treatment's working or not. And if they do need to come in to have another assessment and consultation and maybe a change to their treatment regimen. Clay, yeah, what are your just, thoughts on that? Yeah. Clay, do you ever have a patient ask if this medicine is going to be habit forming or if they might get addicted to it? 
You know, Michael, it's funny you say that because most patients will not ask proactively, but if I address it, a lot of them will tell me that that's a concern that they have. And so mm -hmm. remember that for antidepressants, by day 90, about half patients have stopped the medication. And again, about eight out of nine are not gonna tell you that they did. And so it's very important that we proactively address adherence. And then these, these last bullet points that Karen went over, I'd just like to point out, this was a study. This is not stuff we just threw up on the slide. These were actually you know, multi-regression analysis, uh, rigorous uh, viewpoints of, 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 of actual things that were done instead that improved patient adherence. And so these are tools that need to be in your tool belt uh, in terms of addressing during that first visit uh, when you're talking about pharmacotherapy that can help patients adhere to plan. Because again, as C. Everett Coop, our former surgeon general said, medicines work better when people unscrew the caps and put the medicine in their mouth. <laughs> Well, thanks so much. That's, that's uh, uh, it was wise when he said it, and it remains wise to this day. Uh, Karen, before we turn to uh, to our Q and A session, uh, and, and we're now up over seventy questions, so I I think we'll use all of our remaining time wisely uh, addressing people's questions. Uh, do you have any concluding remarks or, or final pearls to dispense? I don't above and beyond what we've already talked about. I would just, you know, highlight again that you want to include the patient in decision making. And one of the best ways to do that is to make sure that they understand why you're recommending the treatment that you're recommending and what, what they can expect from that treatment. Is it an immediate effect? Is it a delayed effect? Um, when should they call you? When should they um, expect to have their treatment changed if it's not working? So as long as they understand why they're um, on the treatment that they're on, I think you're going to get much better adherence and results. And I'll say not to forget about the psychotherapy, the exercise, the self-care and self-help sure. aspects of the management of depression too. How about you, Clay, on our 20th anniversary of our uh, uh, first shared presentation, uh, what words of wisdom can you dispense before we go to Q&A? I just want to say how much better it is uh, than when you and I shared that stage in Atlanta 20 years ago. Um, we have better tools. We have better tools for assessment. We have better tools for treatment, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. We have a greater understanding of exercise. I mean, Trevetti and his guys down in Texas, they figured out, you know, kilojoules per kilogram and, you know, how it, it's, it's very specific how much exercise is needed. MBCT, I had never heard of it 20 years ago. And so, you know, we have a, a number of, of uh, therapeutic arms that the arm and therapy that, that join uh, in helping patients. So depression is tough to treat, but we have tougher tools than we used to have and better tools than we used to have. Uh, the atypicals we talked about. We talked about these uh, single drug agents that have SSRI qualities, but they also have other modulatory qualities uh, that can be extremely helpful. So, you know, I'm excited. I, I think the, the farm and non-farm approaches make sense. The therapeutic alliance being stronger makes sense and patients can and will get better if you insist on treating them in a rigorous fashion. And, and speaking of new tools, we, we can now talk about the objective, objectives of our talks using uh, the acronym SMART, and, and that is we want to accomplish uh, specific, measurable, uh, obtainable, relevant, and, and timely goals from our uh, continuing education uh, presentations. And so let's, let's think about our SMART goals for tonight. We want uh, our participants to be able to identify at least one specific scale for, for depressive disorder. And, and we have talked a lot about the PHQ-9 here. In, in terms of uh, measurable, we, we would want to use measurement-based care in terms of our practice and keeping track of how ill our patients are when we begin treatment and gauging their progress through the treatment process using a simple scale like uh, the PHQ-9. Uh, and then we also want to have uh, uh, goals and, and treatments that are attainable. And of course, uh, uh, the SSRIs and SNRIs remain a, a standard of care, but we have many other options now to move through in order to help our patients go from ill to better uh, to well. And, and then when our first and second line choices don't work, we want to have uh, another uh, group of options to bring in in the second, third, and fourth line uh, treatment strategies uh, when the SSRIs and SNRIs deliver uh, a suboptimal result. So I'm going to go back in and open up uh, the questions here. 
and we will be with you just in one moment to get there. So I think the count is up over 70. Um, and I'm just going to alternate and, um, and, and, and just I'll, I'll ask uh, each of you alternating questions, a bit, but if you've got more to comment on, on I'll take every third. And, and if you, one of us gives an incomplete answer, please, Karen or, or Clay, uh, help complement the answer with, with, let's use our wisdom collectively. Uh, Karen, I will not put you on the spot with questions about specific medications, if that's okay with you. That uh, is fine. <laughs> okay. Clay, when would you cho choose mirtazapine as a first line antidepressant? Uh, when patients are not concerned about weight gain, I actually use mirtazapine uh, to help patients who are anorectic um, and an off-label use. And so if patients are concerned about weight gain, I don't choose mirtazapine. If someone's underweight or they have insomnia, mirtazapine can be a good choice. It does have decent efficacy. Uh, but again, it tends to make patients a little sedated and it tends to uh, increase their appetite. And so I'm kind of looking for that specific patient that needs those side effects rather than would want to avoid those side effects. Great. Uh, Karen, you're, you're working with a patient who's a lot better. Um, she or he wants to stop their medication. Uh, you do the PHQ-9, their score is three. It sounds like they're in remission. What are the pros and cons? Should she stop? Should she continue? I think I would focus on um, why maybe the improvements uh, occurred. You know, the medication played a role in that and go over the PHQ-9 scores before the treatment and the PHQ-9 scores at the current uh, visit where she's reporting that she's feeling much better and let her see that the medication more than likely played a large role in that. Um, and, you know, also explore what other things she might be doing. Has she implemented lifestyle changes? Has she changed her diet? Is she exercising? Has she processed through a large stressor? Is she getting psychotherapy? Um, you know, she feels like she has other things in place to help with the depressing depression, um, then maybe she could start titrating off or weaning off of the medication with my help. But just knowing that the symptoms might come back because the medication seemed to have played a large role. I, I still <laughs> want her on, once she gets to remission, I still want her on medication for six months or even 12 months, Michael. Am I being too harsh there? Or is that still, is there evidence to support that clinical choice? No, I think after a first effective course of medicine for someone who doesn't have highly recurrent depression, six to nine months of treatment with six months or so in a remitted or nearly remit remitted states, the standard of, uh, of practice for, for someone in their third or greater lifetime episode, you, you would talk about indefinite treatment. Mm -hmm. Indefinite is not a synonym it's, it's, it's not uh, mush mouthing for lifetime because I honestly don't know what's in store in, in this person's lifetime, but I, I do know what's in store over the next year or so. And once you've had three episodes of depression, you have a, at least a 50-50 chance of, of relapsing within the next year if you would come off medication. So, so Clay, I, I think you gave uh, good counsel there. Um, now, um, this one I'm gonna ask Karen, um, Karen, why didn't we include a pharmacist in this process? A pharmacist could have balanced uh, so many different aspects of the talk. What do you think about that? You, you are a, aren't you a vice president in a healthcare system? How do you engage pharmacists in, in your work? We do engage pharmacists. You know, a lot of palliative care teams actually do have pharmacists on their team um, because they're just a wealth of knowledge and information. So they can help us to see where you know, certain drugs would interact and, and maybe cause worse side effects for a patient based on um, comorbidities and other treatments that they're taking. So I think a pharmacist um, is always someone that's very wise and helpful to have on your team um, when you're administering medications. Well, one, of great. We didn't, one of the things we didn't talk about, Michael, was the, the value of collaborative care. So somebody like yourself in psychiatry collaborating with somebody like me in primary care having a, a nurse manager or social worker do some case management and sort of looking at population health of, you know, what's the average PHQ-9 of all patients and are we moving that down? Uh, identifying patients who are having trouble taking medication or adherence, 
this sort of case registry approach uh, can be very effective. And so the question about including a pharmacist, I think, really gets to that value of collaborative care. And if you're interested in that, you can just Google collaborative. It could be there, do, do a, a PubMed search, or you can look up the Diamond program. It's just one of many examples of collaborative care and how it can be beneficial. So kudos to whomever in our audience brought up this important topic. And I would say I've never reached out to a pharmacist that wasn't willing and, and happy to help answer questions. So, um, you know, you should always access them if you have any concerns. So we're, we're taken to the woodshed or behind the woodshed by one of our participants about not talking more about the cost of patented medications. And yes, indeed, cost <laughs> is a factor. Uh, I, I work in the Philadelphia area, and for many of my patients, I, I cannot prescribe a branded antidepressant or a branded newer generation antipsychotic unless I've gone through at least two trials with uh, uh, with generically available medication. And so so I, I think for many of us, um, you, you do need to do your first couple of treatment trials with uh, uh, generic uh, medications. And, and yes, indeed, we, we probably should have uh, mentioned uh, cost uh, more explicitly uh, in our presentation. It's in uh, our class, but I'll, I'll push back, Michael, and I'll say that, you know, we don't, this, this is not like hypertension where we have uh, a good bit of time before things change. You know, after two failed therapies, we're in, uh, you know, pretty tough territory, as Stardy has said, and then you and you and Rush sort of define TRD or treatment resistant depression as failure of two adequate trials of adequate duration. And so, you know, this two-step therapy can be a double-edged sword because if we putz around uh, with medicine that doesn't work for patients, uh, the cost of depression can can be quite uh, difficult itself. So I, I practice in a pretty poor county. I'm sympathetic, but I also, you know, it, it needs to be a good therapy, not just a cheap therapy. Uh, so Karen, in, in your care setting, when do people get referrals to psychiatrists? Is it uh, only when they're psychotic, or are there other important factors to pass on? So uh, we are nurse practitioner led. So um, we have community-based palliative care programs where the nurse practitioner is the provider going into the patient's home setting. And we do actually have, we use the Beck's depression inventory and it's embedded in our documentation templates. So if the nurse practitioner identifies that the patient is having some depression symptomology, um, she, she or he will check the box and it will populate the tool and then they can do that tool. And if they feel comfortable um, with treating generalized depression, then they will do so. If they feel like they need to refer out um, to a psychiatrist or a therapist or even um, elicit the help of a social worker, they absolutely will do that. Um, but typically, you know, I think Clay spoke to it earlier. If, if um, you know, we're seeing some some mental health issues that go above and beyond beyond generalized depression, then we typically will refer out and ask for that collaborative effort to to manage that patient. You, you refer to the psychiatrist for the same reason you refer to the cardiologist. You don't know what's going on, so you don't have a diagnosis. You know what's going on, you have a diagnosis, but the patient's not getting better despite your best efforts. Mm -hmm. The patient wants to go see the cardiologist or the psychiatrist or the cardiologist or the psychiatrist, you know what's going on, but they provide a service you don't. If somebody needs ECT, I can't do that. And so they're, they're going there. I don't do PCTI or, or cardiac cast. And so I may know exactly what the problem is, but I may send them to the cardiologist for that reason. So I don't know what's happening. I know what's happening, they're not getting better. I know what's happening, but I don't do what they need to get better, or the patient prefers it. Those are the reasons to refer in, in my setting. Yeah, that's good. So I'm going to ask both of you this interesting question. How has COVID-19 affected your practices? Quite a bit. <laughs> I'm sure Clay can speak to that. Um, we literally had to uh, build and incorporate a telehealth program um, as our palliative care program um, in the community because we were unable to go into patients' homes and skilled nursings and assisted livings. Um, and so, you know, it really did, I think, 
result in a lot of a lot more depression with our patients because there was a lot more isolation. Um, sometimes our providers were the only people that would come to their home and visit with them. So, you know, I think it caused a, a, a lot of sadness for patients as well as the providers that made things much more difficult, but um, we were able to access them and manage their care and um, coordinate their care with other providers. And now things are pretty much back to normal, believe it or not. I know COVID numbers are still spiking, but facilities are more welcoming to let us in and, and treat our patients. And we definitely are going into the homes as long as everyone is uh, COVID negative and we're not bringing a risk to the patient. So I think that we have found our footing. It's well, thank improved, you. Yeah. It's improved our practice, Michael. Um, we have more flexibility for patients. We can do analog visits, mm -hmm. in-person visits, and we can do digital visits now. Uh, we weren't doing any telehealth before, zero, mm -hmm. before COVID. And now I don't ever envision us going back to a fully analog system. It's made consultation with people like you uh, easier and more acceptable to patients because I, I have the capability, you know, patients know what telehealth is now. So in a rural area where they might not be able to drive to the tertiary medical center, they're used to looking at a screen and talking to a, a, a talking head. So it's made consultation easier. Um, it, it's made um, uh, treatment more available to patients. So I, I think it's better. I think this is like Uber and taxis. I don't think we're ever going back. Telehealth is now part of medicine. We just had to face it. Well, uh, Clay, a, a compliment came in to you about uh, your tip about asking for adherence in quantitative terms that I'm going to, it says, I'm going to remember this. And uh, so you made a difference tonight. Um, I'll give, I'll give uh, our participants another tip about this. If a person fills their monthly prescription every five weeks, they, they are missing a quarter of their doses. This is, uh, you, you, you can also infer how, how non-adherent the person is by how often their 30-day or 90-day fills get uh, get get filled. And, and don't ask uh, you how you know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I was the senior author on the study that raised about five questions here. So so I want to take a little time. We've we've got still I think about a half an hour. So. Um, uh, I'll take a little time to, to explain this study in more detail. It was the, the chart that Dr. Jackson reviewed that showed the two uh, pie charts. One, one showing that if you had more than 20% improvement after two weeks of treatment, you had about a 60% chance of getting better. And if you had less than 20% improvement after two weeks, you had only about a 10% chance of getting better. So, so the, the, the number needed to treat based on that metric is profound and, 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 and large. And, and so that is a really meaningful thing. But there was a lot of confusion because people have been taught that you need three weeks, four weeks, five weeks to see whether or not an antidepressant works. So two months, two months. We're not, yeah, two months. But here we're not talking about whether it's going to work. We're talking about whether it's not going to work. And, and, and that, I know that doesn't sound, it sounds like just a, a wordplay, but it is much easier to predict non-response than it is to predict re response. And, and so the, the trick here was that people who are experiencing no early improvement, less than 20% in the first two weeks, are extremely unlikely to benefit from continuing that treatment. So, so if you use a two-week assessment, and you see less than 20% improvement, you need to ramp up the dose, add an adjunct, change antidepressant, add psychotherapy, do something differently. So, so we can't predict response at two weeks, but, but we can with, with fairly high likelihood uh, predict non-response. And, and that is, uh, uh, that, that's important in terms of taking action because every time a treatment fails, the patient has a, a chance of dropping out of treatment and the chance that the next treatment will work uh, is is reduced. And, and so uh, we're, we're using, go, go ahead. I'm sorry, I, I think of it this way. Am I, am I thinking about it wrong or is it too simplistic? I, I think of if they don't have that 20% move that, um, that has high negative predictive value, but if they do have the 20% move, 
it does not have high positive predictive value. Is that's that right. The positive right? predict the positive predictive value here is like fifty five percent, but the negative yeah. predictive value is is ninety one percent. So, yeah. so that that that's that's the deal. Um, yeah. and, and so everything you were taught about needing six to eight weeks to see if it was going to work it, is still true. It's just you don't need six to eight weeks to see if it's definitely not going to work. That, right, that you can right. find quickly. Um, now, um, who wants to talk about pregnancy and antidepressants? <laughs> Uh, let, let me begin by, by saying that, that depression is bad news for a, a pregnant woman and, and her developing fetus and, and is associated with uh, a lower than expected uh, birth weight. It is associated with a greater uh, than, than chance uh, risk of miscarriage, and it's associated with postpartum depression. If you are depressed during your pregnancy, the chances that your depression will worsen in the postpartum ha have increased. So, so depression in pregnancy needs to be treated. You, you can't stand idly by and, and just say, oh, well, I, I, I fear uh, doing harm. Now, that said, there are good studies about interpersonal psychotherapy, cognitive therapy, uh, other kinds of self-help influence therapies, uh, so, so that you don't have to treat with an antidepressant medication. Uh, but if you must treat with an antidepressant medication, uh, the SSRIs have been fairly well studied. M most of them are uh, category uh, C, meaning that they may have small risk, but they don't have notorious or, or uh, truly dangerous risk. And, and even the small risk are on the order of maybe one or 2% over and above uh, placebo or, or the base rate. Uh, here. Uh, so, you, you, you know, obviously, if, if a baby is born uh, uh, from a mother taking an antidepressant, the baby may experience a, a brief discontinuation syndrome. Maybe their APGAR score is a tiny bit lower and, and so forth. But, but the harm of not treating uh, depression during pregnancy by, by far outweighs any of the small risks. You, you just need to bring the mother to be her partner and, and if possible, and have a heart to heart. Uh, discussion about these risks and and these potential benefits. Uh, you know, Michael, is... I feel I feel very comfortable with the SSRIs in pregnancy. Um, and you mentioned that birth rate can can be affected by depression itself. The SSRIs show a slight decrease in birth weight, but it's it's statistically significant, but not really clinically significant. We're talking about you know, uh, if you're talking about a three thousand gram baby, maybe a, a, a 30, 40 gram. Uh, drop off. It's it's really not um, clinically significant decreased weight in, in the vast majority of, of children born. Okay. Um, Karen, here's a question asking you to reinterpret how you score the PHQ-9 and where can you get it? So do you have the answer to both of those questions? Um, no. Google? I know you can find it. Yes, um, you, can, you can get it on Google. <laughs> just just do your test right now. Go into Google, Google PHQ-9, and I guarantee you within two minutes, you will have a PHQ-9 in your hand. Uh, yeah. it, it may not be the fancy recurrent one that you just plug the numbers in. It might be the kind that you just get a PDF and have to print it, but uh, it, it is not patented and it's in the public domain. Now, Karen, really quickly go over the yeah. score. Go over the scoring of the PHQ-9. Uh -huh. so, yeah. so, so the higher the score, the the worse symptomology that the patient is experiencing. So the worse the depression. And the goal with treatment, of course, is to get a lower score. You've got nine items, each scored zero to three. The maximum score is 27. Um, the uh, range of people depressed versus not depressed typically is drawn at 10 with each five increase in points, you move up a qualitative unit in, in severity. And we, we basically say you need to see 50% improvement or more to say that the medication has had a, a, a measurable effect. Um, uh, Clay, do you make any use of pharmacogenomics? Uh, are you practicing precision medicine in your treatment of depressed patients? I don't, and that may make me public enemy number one of the people who sell the pharmacogenomics. Um, I think for some patients, it can be beneficial, particularly for those that are in a, a TRD category, treatment-resistant depression, or if they've had unexpected adverse events with lots of, uh, with lots of uh, problems. 
uh, individual patients, it may be helpful. I'm still looking for the outcome studies that show robust differences in treatment. Um, and Michael, you'd be more aware of them than I am, but I, I'm still looking for the sort of smoking gun that shows we need to in, implement this in routine practice, and I haven't seen it. Uh, well, in our, in our big large scale study, not done in veterans, we found that using it ad, added about 7% to your chances of treatment success. And, and so you have to say at what price would society value a 7% chance? Mm -hmm. Only about 30 to 40% of us have multiple uh, genomic markers that contribute to non-response or poor tolerability. So each time you cast the line, there's a better than chance that, that you're not going to bring anything in uh, with, with it. But for those patients who have multiple uh, markers uh, of poor tolerability or, or, or non-response, um, having that information does guide. I think ultimately society will decide for the difficult to treat folks who have two or more misadventures or, or non-success with medication, it, it may be worth that, that contribution to success. I think that's where I put it, but in my practice, I'd rather spend the money, the time, the effort, and the, the energy toward adherence of what they are taking and uh, you know the non-pharmacologic stuff uh, rather than shooting for pharmacogenomics out of the gate. I, I do agree with you, the TRD population may be appropriate. Okay, we have a handful, maybe five total questions about adding bupropion or Wellbutrin uh, to various SSRIs. I have some things to say about that, but I've been talking too much. Uh, uh, Clay, when do you add bupropion to an SSRI such as ser sertraline, and, and why didn't you do that for Barbara? So um, I didn't do it for Barbara because I wanted to switch therapy. She already had two adverse events to an SSRI, so I didn't want to keep a drug that was bad for her around. She wasn't getting to remission, uh, and we also, she didn't have a fast response rate, and she already had two adverse events. So I thought switch was better than, than dual therapy for her, to be honest. Um, with bupropion, uh, you know, there's still some old studies that shows that stuff is helpful for cigarette smokers in terms of if they're ready to quit. I mean, very few people take it and go, oh my goodness, I never want another cigarette again. That hit me from the blue. But if they're motivated to quit, it can be a pharmacologic help. Um, so that's a patient to think about. Um, a patient who struggles with motivation and may need what we term a little activation, bupropion tends to be activating for some patients. So if they need a little more get up and go, so to speak, um, I sometimes think of bupropion uh, for those patients. So that's kind of where I use it. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from you statistically where you think which types of patients respond. Interestingly, there's a really large um, meta-analysis of, of 25 different studies looking at combining antidepressants. And, and shockingly, as often as we combine bupropion with other antidepressants, it did not fare well uh, in this meta-analysis. The, the most useful combination involved an SSRI or SNRI in, in combination with mirtazapine. Um, I, I, I think there is some merit in adding bupropion uh, when you have partial benefit uh, with the SSRI, maybe some diminished libido or delay to orgasm as a potential side effect that, that uh, bupropion might override. And I think particularly when the patient's got symptoms that bupropion targets more specifically, such as low energy, tendency to oversleep, uh, perhaps increased appetite or, or, or weight gain. Uh, bupropion is seldom used now as a monotherapy, although it is a good antidepressant. It's just no longer primarily used alone. It's typically used in, in combination uh, with SSRIs or, or SNRIs. Now, uh, here is a really challenging question. Let me get back to it. Okay, I see patients all the time that are being treated with two different SSRIs or an SSRI and an SNRI together. What's the rationale for this? Dr. Jackson, do you know the rationale for that? I think the rationale for two SSRIs is probably that uh, someone didn't do a med rec list. I, I really don't know <laughs> why we would choose. <laughs> I, I I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend an SSRI plus an SNRI as well. Um, you know I, I think it behooves us to know the mechanism of action of drugs that we're that we're using. There, 
there may be a scenario where um, SSRI plus SNRI would be appropriate, but I typically don't choose that treatment path just because we have more appealing combinations with better data behind them, not just theory. Um, but two SSRIs together, I, I just uh, could not endorse. Because we have 20 some minutes to go, I'll tell you a story. When I uh, was a, a young psychiatrist working at a community mental health center on Wednesday evenings, um, I, I got a patient who came to me taking the combination of nortriptyline and amitriptyline. And, and as many of you know, uh, amitriptyline is converted in your liver to nortriptyline. Uh, so, so this seemed to me to be a completely foolish uh, combination. Um, and so I spent the next year painstakingly trying to increase one and decrease the other and either get the patient on only nortriptyline or only amitriptyline. Each time my attempt to simplify and do the right thing led to some worsening. When I left the <laughs> health center three years later, the patient was taking the combination of nortriptyline and, and amitriptyline. And, and I just wrote a note. Uh, saying, please don't spend any more time trying to change the medicine. I, I bet there is a patient or two out there who somehow managed to do better on an oddball combination of medications that shouldn't have been preferentially <laughs> more effective. Uh, and, 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 and that is the only justification I could make for somebody being on some combination of, of either two SSRIs or SR, SSRI and an SNRI is that somehow those two work better for them than, than anything else uh, seem to. And, and that is uh, uh, empiric medicine at its best and, and at its worst. Our, our patients' experiences with our treatment can indeed be humbling. Um, in, your, um, in your palliative medicine program, do you use much trazodone, Karen? Does, does, do your doctors prescribe much trazodone? We do, um, yes, a lot for anxiety and sleeplessness for um, specifically cancer patients, but also, you know, some of our dementia patients as well. Okay. And, and um, uh, do you, do you think it's the preferred strategy for managing insomnia in, in such patients, especially the, the older dementia patients who, who have lots of insomnia? No, actually, um, a lot of them, interestingly enough, have some underlying depression. So I actually had a lot of success using SSRIs in those patients and um, usually did help them sleep. And then some anxiolytics too, um, sometimes in combination. But uh, you don't wanna rule out uh, some of the natural stuff too. Sometimes melatonin was very helpful, believe it or not, um, or just managing their sleep-wake cycles too. Yeah, I think um, even though trazodone is not a common cause of delirium in the elderly, uh, uh, occasionally you can see sundowning uh, with it, even though it might be prescribed for um, uh, trying to help the patient sleep and, and, and not have nocturnal confusion. Uh, mm -hmm. here's, a, here's a tough one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step up and do. Please explain me the mechanism for antidepressants and suicidality in, in youth and, and people up to 25 years of age. Um, the, the SSRIs and SNRIs and, and probably the, the newer still patent protected uh, antidepressants are associated with, with a small risk of uncomfortable activation during, during the first week or two of therapy. And, and uncomfortable activation is, is a, a broad construct, but, but it can include restlessness, agitation, worsening insomnia, um, racing negative thoughts. And for some people, this combination is associated with the onset uh, of suicidal thoughts when they weren't there before or the worsening uh, of, of suicidal thoughts. Now, uh, interestingly, that risk of uncomfortable activation uh, diminishes by about age 25. And in the uh, post age 25 group, the risk of uncomfortable activation is ac actually somewhat higher with placebo uh, than it is with the antidepressant. So, so there's something in neurodevelopment and, and people think this is actually a maturational function of the serotonin component uh, of, how, uh, of, of the serotonin tracks that help to modify uh, arousal that, that, that for some of us, um, 
th this can be too uncomfortably activating and, and that's proposed to be one of the mechanisms of action. It, it may be people at risk for bipolar disorder uh, have a higher uh, incidence of this and, and maybe what we're talking about here is something called a mixed state uh, in, in which a person who has been depressed now suddenly has racing negative thoughts and inability to sleep and, and a need to move about. And, and so um, th this is probably the mechanism. Now that's, that's the, the kind of theoretical explanation of it. Um, uh, a, a little story to tell you is, is that after the recognition of, of the side effect in, in approximately uh, uh, 2003, um, uh, a, a very, very careful and comprehensive scale to assess suicidality in antidepressant treatment trials was developed. And, and since that scale was developed, evidence that this actually happens has disappeared. Um, yeah. and, and, and so what, what, what I'm saying is that when you do this specifically focused on suicidality, antidepressants don't actually cause it. it antidepressants cause a broader range of uncomfortable activations that, that can include suicidality. But, but on the Columbia scale for, suicide, for, for rating suicidal uh, ideation and symptoms, um, I, I've got the acronym wrong. It's a CSRS, CSSRS. Um, uh, we, we cannot see it with, with the newer antidepressants and we don't see it with the older ones either. So it, it, there is something there, but it's not specifically about suicide, suicidality. Now, nevertheless, every antidepressant introduced in the last 30 years now carries a box warning, as do, as do all the newer generation antipsychotics because they are given to people who take antidepressants, even though the newer generation antipsychotics have never been shown to cause this problem. How about I that? Think, I, I, think that, I think that was an awesome explanation. I, I think of it, Michael, in terms of the spaghetti slide. And it's one mm -hmm. of the reasons that we put it in. Patients have individualized responses. And I also recall that bipolarity is uh, more common in depressed patients if their uh, depression occurs before age 25. And so I, I think of those two things, you know, make sure we have the right diagnosis, a true unipolar disease, and also individual responses, and, and we just talk to patients about it. Um, Karen, what are your preferred strategies for helping people, first of all, with bad insomnia and depression, second of all, who oversleep uh, in their depression? Do you have preferential interventions? Well, I think sleep hygiene um, is key for all of us, so, you know, getting to bed at a specific time and setting alarm and starting to wake up at a specific time. It can help the adrenals regulate and hormones balance and um, get your melatonin to kick in when it's supposed to. So I think that that's very important. And then stress reduction, you know, I think exercise is really good to help introduce um, fatigue when it should be um, felt and you could get out your stress exercising, but you know, it's insomnia, yeah, sleep routine, sleep hygiene, you can introduce medications as well. Um, there are supplements um, like L-theanine and melatonin and um, some natural things like that. Of course, if someone is having a lot of trouble with insomnia, you want to advise them to cut out caffeine and anything that's stimulating. Um, so those are just some, some key lifestyle changes that you can focus on with patients. How about the oversleeper? Yeah, the oversleeper, I would look at adrenal function, quite honestly. So it's something where you may want to look at their hormones um, and their cortisol levels, because a lot of times the oversleepers are the people that we think of that self-medicate. So maybe coffee or caffeine to get going and maybe wine or some other type of alcohol to wind down at night. Um, typically, they don't get good quality sleep either. So maybe a lot of waking throughout the night, interrupted sleep. Um, so that's a patient where I would really explore stressors and um, lifestyle and, of course, uh, adrenal function. How about sleep apnea as a possibility? Ooh, a sleep study. So uh, <laughs> we're out for a sleep study, and uh, they can do those in the homes now, too. 
Um, so that's, yeah, that tends to be um, a big part of why people have interrupted sleep. And for those that are experiencing the interrupted sleep or snoring, their spouses also don't get good sleep. But, you know, typically with a sleep study, they can determine if a patient is experiencing sleep apnea, and then they can use a, a CPAP and typically get a good response to that. And so many good questions. I wish we could get to them all. And uh, I think yes. you've done an admirable job of, of teeing them up for us. But uh, our, our audience uh, and, and our colleagues tonight have shown a remarkable depth of questions. I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the questions yeah. that they've asked. And they've been challenging and engaging for me. Yeah, I was prepared to go a full another 15 minutes with all these questions, but uh, uh, you can't you can't say we uh, we were stingy on on, on, on the time tonight. So uh, thanks to everybody for uh, for tuning in uh, for this event, and and thank you uh, particularly to uh, Karen and Clay for helping uh, with just make this show come alive and and do our uh, you know do our CME best to help improve the care of your depressed patients. I'll remind you to receive credit uh, for this activity that you must complete the post-test post -test and evaluation uh, online. Uh, participants will be able to download and, pr and print their certificate immediate, immediately upon completion. So thanks so much, and I look forward to the chance to working with you again.